following podcast contains descriptions of rape, sexual abuse, and murder. Listener discretion is advised. I know that we were on the other side of Wendover, but I'm not sure of the mileage out there in the desert someplace. We went way back off on this little road off the highway and we were arguing out behind the car. I told him, I said, Sherman, what are we going to do with that girl? He said, well, she's got to die. And I said, well, that's just ridiculous. Why she got to die? He said, well, uh, he says, you know, kidnapping carries the death penalty too. And like I said, this is before they did away with that. No way, I said. Number one, we haven't hurt the girl, I says. She hasn't been hurt, and there's no way they can give us the death penalty for it, even if they bust us. So I thought, I thought I'd talked him out of it. And I turned around, started for the car when the gun started to go off. And I just froze. Because that first shot went off, I knew it was too late. The 1970s, the era of some of the most heinous serial killers of all time. Charles Manson, Ted Bundy, the Zodiac Killer, and the McCrary family. Though little known today, they were one of the most murderous families in history. Violent, nasty, and they didn't care about anything other than gratifying their own base desires. These people would kill a human being like others of us might step on an ant. Led by a psychopathic patriarch and his depraved son-in-law. Sherman was a small-time screw-up. Carl was a small-time screw-up. When these guys got together, there was a chemistry between them. And then at some point, they walked into that Winchell's Donut Shop in Salt Lake City and saw Sherry Martin. And just robbing the donut shop became, let's take the girl. They roamed the country robbing, raping, and killing up to 22 people in 1971 and 72. Most of them, very young women. She was on her stomach, dumped in this field. One of her legs was cocked up like she was trying to crawl, totally naked, no clothes around, off of two dirt roads, terrorizing the American landscape until they were finally brought to justice. Roger turned to Carl and said, if you give us any problems whatsoever, Joe is just going to shoot you through the seat. You're about to hear their story, raw and ruthless, as we dig up the never-before-told secrets of this killer family. Sherman McCrary. He was kicked out of the Navy. They considered him a sociopath. He was just a very, very angry and a violent person. Where they went, how they killed, and how they stumped the police. I mean, their their crime spree, you know, went coast to coast from Florida to to Portland and Missouri and Texas in between. And we'll hear, for the first time, exclusive prison recordings of one of the killers. After we killed the girls, we never talked about it. We said nothing and rode along in the car and just tried to ignore it. As he tells all. I've been on this ride alone the sun goes down I howl and moan And I know the cries of fellow aching souls I need something to calm A scent I track that leads me on And I show my teeth Cause time has made me cold From Wondery and Trooper Entertainment This is Families Who Kill, The Donut Shop Murders. My eyes are closed, my eyes are closed. My name is James Carroll, and I'm a filmmaker in Los Angeles. I'm currently driving on the I-80 eastbound from Salt Lake City to Lakewood, Colorado. In 1971 and 72, this was the very roadway haunted by two sadistic men, Carl Taylor and his father-in-law, Sherman McCrary, who kidnapped and killed up to 20 young women in seven different cities across the U.S., most of them taken from donut shops. 
In the past few years, I've become very familiar with the habits of sadistic killers. As the co-director of Netflix's documentary series, The Night Stalker, we told the story of Richard Ramirez's heinous killing spree back in 1985. And now I want to tell the story of the McCrary Taylors and their family and the brutal crimes that rattled the police and shook the nation. This is a tale of what happens when an American family unites around a profoundly evil undertaking. This is Families Who Kill, The Donut Shop Murders. August 12, 1971, just over 50 years ago, on a balmy night in Salt Lake City, the Martin family was propelled into an irretrievable nightmare. Here's what went down. 10.30 p.m. parked outside a Winchell's Donut House near 1700 South State was an officer with the Salt Lake City Police Department. Something about the shop was off. The Venetian blinds were closed as if the store was closed, but Winchell's was a 24-hour joint. The officer buzzed the franchise owner, who confirmed that the shop should be open. 17-year-old high school grad Sherry Martin was supposed to be working the late shift, flying solo. The owner and cop found the place locked. Sherry's car was parked outside. Inside, $83 was gone from the register. Could Sherry, wondered the police, have grabbed the cash and split? No way, her parents said. She was an eminently reliable girl and a devout Mormon. Kind-hearted, her favorite hobby was sewing. And there was no reason for her to run away. She was starting at Dixie College in the fall. But now, she had vanished into thin air, or at least it seemed. What happened at this cozy little donut shop where regulars sipped the house blend and munched on powdered jellies? And what in the world happened to young Sherry Martin? Crime writers Anya Kane and Kevin Greenlee are experts on this case and have been studying it for years. They run the Murder Sheet podcast. So the employee Manning Winchell's Donut House in Salt Lake City on August 12th, 1971, was 17-year-old Sherry Martin. Uh, She was a local girl. Actually, tragically, she lived about like a 20-minute drive away from where this happened. And this was just sort of her summer job that she was working to earn a few extra bucks. So on that night, uh, a female customer coming coming in a bit late actually noticed that there were two strange men sitting at one of the tables, drinking coffee, and making creepy, lewd comments. Just, she was very uncomfortable with this situation. Uh, She made her purchases and left. And unfortunately, she was actually the last person to ever see Sherry Martin alive, other than her killers. Uh, What happened next was that uh, the two men at the table drinking coffee, who were, of course, uh, Carl Taylor and Sherman McCrary, robbed the donut shop at gunpoint. They made off, the, the the reports aren't really clear about how much money they made off with, but it was anywhere between, I think, like 80 and $200. And she, uh, they, they weren't just there to rob the store, unfortunately. They took Sherry, uh, kidnapped her in a vehicle, tied her hands behind her back with her own nylon stockings, and she... Um, and they, they murdered her out, out in the desert. They actually crossed state lines into Nevada uh, and shot her anywhere from seven to eight times. Authorities did realize that she was shot with a 32 caliber weapon and that in a rather bizarre twist, she had been shot while naked and then her killers redressed her when they left her and they left her wrapped in a blanket. One interesting thing about this story was that an FBI agent named Joe Quick came into the case two days later, and his investigation showed that the store had basically been wiped clean. They couldn't find fingerprints anywhere. So you can actually see from the introduction of the FBI into this case pretty quickly that authorities were taking this seriously. And I think that makes this story a little bit more scary because even when local law enforcement is taking this disappearance turned murder seriously, the the McCrary Taylor family would go on to murder so many more people. It almost didn't matter. You heard Anya and Kevin mention the names Carl and Sherman, who were lewd and disruptive and making people uncomfortable in the coffee shop. That's Carl Taylor and his father-in-law, Sherman McCrary, the murderous duo at the heart of this podcast. 17-year-old Sherry Martin was one of their first known victims. 46-year-old McCrary and 33-year-old Taylor were two men of little education and searing poverty. 
both victims of abuse who had extensive rap sheets long before they met each other. And long before they ever set foot in that donut shop off the I-15 highway they traveled often. Two men who, along with their families, would go from being petty grifters to the masterminds of a year-long killing spree. Two men who, despite the horrific carnage they unleashed, are relatively unknown until today. Six months earlier, January 1971, Athens, Texas. Carl Taylor is the newest member of the McCrary family, a tight-knit clan of degenerate outsiders living in Athens, Texas, a sleepy town where elderly Texans go to retire, the black-eyed peak capital of the world, and the home base of one of the most murderous families in history. Carl has recently married into the McCrary family. His new wife, Ginger McCrary, is the daughter of Sherman and Liz McCrary, Sherman and Liz also have a son named Danny and another daughter named Tammy. Carl and Ginger are already raising kids of their own, and Carl has grown very chummy with his hard-drinking, erratic father-in-law, Sherman. All under one roof, usually in trailer homes, the family is as tightly bound as it gets. Everybody works for the family business, and that family business is crime. Here's Anya and Kevin again, who run the Murder Sheet podcast. The way we became aware of the McCrary-Taylor murders uh, was we were basically looking to assemble a very massive spreadsheet of different restaurant-related crimes for our first season of the murder sheet. We wanted to look at a variety of different cases involving restaurants. And I think it was me. We were kind of just, um, you know, goofing around on newspapers.com, searching keywords like uh, you know, restaurant murders, cafe murders. Um, I typed in uh, donut shop murders and this came up. And I remember just turning to Kevin and being like, have you ever heard of this? This is this is a nutty case, you know, a family of serial killers preying on young women across the country. And we kind of just took it from there. The McCrary Taylor family was largely at first based Uh, around a town called Athens, Texas. That is the county seat of Henderson County in Texas. And the two men uh, of the family, uh, Taylor and Sherman McCrary, would sort of work kind of odd jobs. Uh, Taylor at one point worked as a ranch hand, but they were definitely not well off. Uh, This was a pretty impoverished family. And... um, it seems that uh, even though even though they did not have a particularly good life there, and even though they were very much nomads in terms of you know going around the country to commit their robberies, uh, Athens would remain for quite some time sort of the the base that they would sort of return to after going on these raids and, and killing people. The McCrary family is helmed by. Uh, a man named Sherman. He's a career criminal. He has a rap sheet. He escaped from a prison farm earlier in his career. And he has a host of health problems, a bad back. Uh, All of that's probably not helped by the fact that he uh, drinks a quart of hard liquor every single day and um, is is an alcoholic, is a drunk. And he sort of dominates this family. And in his view, stealing stuff is basically his business. He he views it as you and I might view, you know, opening a shop or, you know, starting a law practice. And so he views that as what he needs to do to support his family. He has a wife named Carolyn. She seems to be very much cowed by him. Actually, her father was a drunk as well, so she's sort of used to this dysfunctional dynamic. She's barely literate, she's very small, has a lot of health problems, and they have two kids, uh, Ginger and uh, a son, Danny. Well, according to Ginger, uh, she was the first one in the family to meet Carl. She met him when she was working at the Snackateria Drive-In in Garland, Texas. Carl would come by uh, every night to have a cup of coffee, and uh, the two of them uh, would start talking, and they struck up uh, a friendship, for lack of a better word. And in fact, they ended up 
getting married to each other uh, within a week of meeting each other. And uh, Ginger said the reason she married him so quickly was because she really wanted to have security for her kids. She had some kids from a previous relationship. Uh, and so then after she married him and brought him into the family, he met Sherman and the two of them really struck up quite a close relationship and really hit it off. I'll just add, because I think this is such a creepy wrinkle to the story, that when you think about Carl sort of wooing Ginger at this snackateria uh, over cups of coffee, you know, he and his future father-in-law would eventually go on to basically stalk women in a similar way at the donut shops where they were preying on, on their victims. They would go in late at night, grab a coffee, you know, make some comments that made people feel uncomfortable within those shops and wait until the sole female employee was the only one around and then they would grab her and, and rob the place. So it's really creepy that the way he met his wife kind of mirrors the way he would go on to kill so many people. 2021 was a crazy year, especially for me. I mean, I know that I woke up almost every single day with anxiety. I was freaking out over something that I was reading or seeing or watching on TV or whatever. This year, I don't want to make mental health a goal. I want to make it part of my daily routine. And I can do that with Talkspace. Talkspace is incredible. It's easy to match with a licensed therapist. I go on there, I answer a couple questions, and I'm instantly connected with a therapist in tune with exactly how I'm feeling and what I need. It's incredible for me to just talk and have someone helping me through my anxieties. It's a licensed therapist that's on the other end, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You don't even have to leave your room or your house or your car. Anywhere that you have a phone, you can connect to Talkspace. Make your mental health more than just a New Year's resolution with Talkspace. Visit Talkspace.com and get $100 off your first month when you use promo code FWK at sign up. That's $100 off at Talkspace.com, promo code FWK. So the other day, me and my buddy, Alan, were out to lunch, and he's talking to me about how he loves his cat and he loves playing around with his cat, but he's dating this girl, and this girl came over complaining about the smell in his house, and I was like, what's the smell in your house, bro? And he's like, it's my cat. And I was like, bro, what kind of cat litter do you have? And he's like, the old kind. I'm like, you got to get out of that immediately because I have a cat. Her name's Tuna. She's like 16 years old. We switched to this incredible kitty litter called Pretty Litter. Pretty Litter super light crystals trap odor and release moisture, resulting in a dry, low maintenance litter that does not smell. You walk into the house now, there is no cat litter smell at all. It's virtually dust free because it's manufactured with a specialized de-dusting process. But above all else, it's a health indicator by changing colors when it detects potential underlying issues. Get the world's smartest litter without leaving home by visiting prettylitter.com and using promo code FWK for 20% off your first order. That's prettylitter.com, promo code FWK for 20% off. Prettylitter.com, promo code FWK. Before Carl and Sherman met, they'd both been in and out of the pen for various crimes, robbery, check fraud, assault, and more. In fact, just a few years prior, Sherman escaped a prison camp in California while he was being shuttled to a psychiatric institution for evaluation. Earlier, he had been booted from the Navy for being diagnosed a sociopath. Joe Moylan is a public information officer with the Weld County Sheriff's Department in Colorado. Before their paths ultimately crossed, they were both, you know, sociopathic, petty thugs, essentially, that were into... Um, thefts and burglaries and, and low-level robberies, and they, neither one of them was very good at it. I think they both spent a lot of time in, uh, in jail in their respective towns before they eventually hooked up. Sherman also has chronic back pain, which makes it hard for him to hold down a regular job doing any kind of manual labor. Heavy set with receding black hair and a bulbous nose, he works occasionally as a church sexton or janitor. But he prefers more expedient methods of getting money. So Sherman McCrary was born in, in Duncanville, Texas, which is a, a suburb, suburb of Dallas, uh, Dallas-Fort Worth. Um, he 
served a brief stint in the Navy, didn't last very long. Um, he was identified as a sociopath during a psychological exam pretty early on and and uh, was booted. Um, he returned to Duncanville, met his wife, Carolyn, who, who often, you know, more commonly went by Liz. Um, they married when she was 16, and, and soon after that, they had Ginger. And then soon after that, he was uh, he was in some kind of an accident where he had this debilitating uh, back injury. So he starts, you know, initially self-medicating with alcohol to uh, take care of his pain. And then, you know, because he can't hold down a job, um, he starts, you know, drinking to give himself that courage to start committing crimes. And starts off as, you know, thefts and burglaries and armed robberies of, of liquor stores and gas stations and what have you. Um, and then in 1962, and, and, and by the way, he wasn't very good at any of this. He got caught all the time. Um, there's reporting and, and documentation saying that there were, there were stints that Ginger remembers where her, her father was gone for days or weeks at a time, presumably serving jail sentences. Um, and then in 1962, he'd kind of, you know, he was too well known in the Duncanville area for, for, his, for his criminal reputation. He moves his family to Athens, quickly gets popped for armed robbery and is sentenced to seven years of prison. When he is released, Ginger is a teenager by, that, by then. She's working at a car hop at a, a local restaurant, a local drive-in restaurant. Um, that's when she meets Carl. They start dating. And uh, when Sherman LeCrae is released from prison, prison, he comes home to find this new guy in Ginger's life, and they immediately hit it off. Carl, for his part, has also led a life of crime from a young age burglary, theft, and more serious offenses. When he was only 16, he was accused of murdering his wife's sister. Yeah, he was already married by the time he met Ginger. Not once, but three times. A few kids, too, left in the dust. By the time Carl Taylor met Ginger, he actually had four different children by several different women, uh, three of whom lived with his mother. About six feet, a smooth talker with black eyes, greasy hair, and a pronounced scar on his lip, Carl holds down odd jobs, often working as a fry cook. But his real vocation is hanging paper wherever he can, a.k.a. passing bad checks, opening a series of bank accounts with an air of respectability, then bilking stores of tens of thousands with checks that would bounce harder than a Super Bowl. Here is Detective Joe Fanchuli, who worked the case as a young detective back in 1971 and 72. They went to work, menial jobs. Uh, Carl was a short order cook. Sherman was a janitor kind of a guy. They went to the local bank and said, uh, hey, uh, you know, I work over here at the Parker House and I'm a short order cook and I want to open a bank account and I want to get some checks. Sure, here you go. Here, here's here's a hundred checks. Um, deposit my first paycheck, and I, I want a hundred checks. Okay, here you go. Here's, that, that was back in the day when people would take would take starter checks. You go into the grocery store with you, you know the blank check that doesn't have any imprinting on it, and and you'd write your name, your address, whatever on the check, and they would they would take it. It's a different time and a different place back then. You got to put yourself into 1970. You got to put yourself into the banking system and, and the commerce system in 1970. There were no credit cards. You either you either paid for things with cash, or you paid for things with a check. Uh, ID was very rudimentary. Uh, you know, you might have a driver's license, kind of thing. People were a lot more trusting in those days. And these people took advantage of it. And, and, but, and see, they, they, didn't, they, they didn't go after the big score. You know, they would, they would go into a small store and they would buy groceries. They'd buy $30 worth of groceries. Or they'd go to the Sears store and they'd buy a toaster or you know, I mean, something that was pawnable, sellable kind of thing. I mean, there were no computers. There was no way to keep track of this stuff. They could go through a, a, a small town and hit stores for a week. And by the time this stuff is making it through the banking system, the non-computerized sort of banking system, 
and all these checks start to bounce and the bank realizes what's going on and then they mail these checks back to the merchant and the four or five days goes by before the merchant gets the check back from the bank that says we're not honoring this you got a lot of lead time there and, and these people would only stick around in a town for a week or two so so they would they would they would do their thing clean out the town and be gone pretty much before anybody realized what was going on that's how they lived they passed checks they were grifters the way they were moving around the country how they were living in small hotels motels uh short order cook job Sherman was a janitor they'd stick around somewhere for a month two months load up the truck load up the cars and be gone we're gonna find these guys you know you weren't gonna find them Sherman liked Carl's bad check con a hell of a lot. Carl's an earner and a provider for his daughter and her family. What's not to like? Here's Detective Joe Fanchuli again on their camaraderie. Sherman Sherman was a screw-up. A small-time screw-up. Carl was a small-time screw-up. When these guys got together, there was a chemistry between them. Of, of one trying to outdo the other. I think that if I had to speculate about why Sherman McCrary and Carl Taylor formed such a close bond, it's that they thought about the world in a very similar way. And you can see that in the quotes that they gave to newspapers and the quotes that they uh, you know, had in, in, in court settings. Basically, it's sort of like this. Sherman McCrary and Carl Taylor both viewed crime, you know, violence, robbery, as a lifestyle, almost as a business. Uh, You had Sherman McCrary talking about it as if it was his business uh, because he couldn't get a normal job because he had a bad back. You had having that sort of shared worldview endeared them to one another and made it easy for them to work with one another. And by the time everything fell apart, I mean, this is a horrible, horrible comparison, but it's almost as if the family business fell apart and everyone's pointing fingers about why it went wrong. But they still viewed it as a family business. But their bond ran deeper than mutual admiration for each other's grifts. Carl and Sherman were both severely abused as children. Sherman was raised by a dirtbag uncle. Carl by a mother who disciplined him by locking him in a cabinet full of rats. Carl's father and his stepfather committed suicide leaving Carl yearning for a father figure. So Carl Taylor, as, as, a, as a boy, was, was born to um, a wildly promiscuous woman. Um, there was just this rotating door of, of abusive fathers. I think she went through six or seven marriages. Uh, when she wasn't married, she was bringing home, uh, you know, alcoholics who had no problem beating on them. She was abusive to them. Um, he was born with a cleft palate, and, and not only did she not do anything to repair it, but she ridiculed him regularly for it. Uh, it, was, it, was, it, was the, it was the local school district that ended up paying for the surgery when he was in first grade. And even then, it was so far along that it didn't even heal properly. I think the state, like Child Protective Services, stepped in at one point and sent him to go live with uh, an aunt and an uncle. Um, who were just as bad as, as his mother was. Carl Taylor, I mean, if you cannot come up with a better blueprint for evil than what Carl Taylor in, endured as a child. So, I mean, they, they fit, to me, they fit the profile. I mean, you look at these two guys and you're like, yeah, yeah, these, I, I can see these guys doing this. Carl Taylor having this sort of traumatic upbringing sort of makes sense that he would gravitate towards sort of a father figure like Sherman McCrary, who's sort of fulfilling that male authority figure role that he seemingly lacked when he was a kid. This is Dr. Lewis Lessinger, a forensic psychologist who frequently consults with law enforcement. I'm a forensic psychologist, which is simply the application of behavioral science to the law, which I've been doing um, 
for you know over over 40 years now, um, helping an investigation. Uh, wh who is the unidentified offender? Not necessarily his name, but the type of individual, based on what he did at a crime scene. Because different individuals. Uh, behave differently at a crime scene given their psychological makeup. And you have to understand these types of individuals. These are very weak and inadequate people. They're nobodies in life. They've accomplished absolutely nothing. These are not happy people. They're miserable people. They're angry and miserable and diminished throughout their whole life. Nobody looks at Sherman McCrary or or, um, or Carl or any of those as, as somebody important in life. Quite the contrary. People look at him as an absolute nobody, and they feel that themselves. Sherman Sherman was sort of a sort of a good old boy. Um, not incredibly bright. Um, uh, screw up kind of person. Um, always looking for sort of the easy way to get through life. Um, basically lazy. Liked his beer. Uh, kind of a loudmouth braggart kind of a guy. Carl was sort of a sort of a snaky kind of guy. Cunning, uh, quick Quick lipped, uh, just just sort of that classic Texas wise guy sort of thing that you you know that you you, you would get from the movies. Um, smart, not book smart, but cunning. evil though uh, I remember Tammy describing him as having shark eyes I heard that shark eyes description attributed to people years later and um, yeah I mean that was Carl he had those black eyes just, just piercing just completely completely opposite personalities Sherman was easily led by somebody like Carl who was a little bit slicker I, I, I don't think that the sexual crimes that the murders rapes and murders of the women I don't think that ever would have happened if either of these guys was solo here's Harold Schechter professor emeritus at Queens College in New York and a world renowned expert on serial killing so in the case of Carl and Sherman, uh, that appears to be an instance of a uh, criminal phenomenon uh, that in French is known as folie à deux, which means a madness shared by two, um, which has a particular application in psychiatry. But again, in criminology, it, it refers to uh, two individuals who by themselves would probably just, you know, commit relatively minor crimes. But something about, you know, their relationship when they get together turns this is very toxic brew of personalities. And then they end up committing often very, very heinous crimes together. And there are many cases of that. You know, you see a classic one, for example, in uh, uh, the case of Terry Smith and Dick Hickok, you know, the two petty criminals at the center of uh, Truman Capote's In Cold Blood, who, again, they had committed these, you know, robberies and so on and so forth, but put them together and, you know, they turn into mass murderers. Or, you know, the Columbine killers, you know, it, it, individually, probably neither one of them uh, would have ever perpetrated that kind of atrocity. But you put them together and, you know, they... Uh, there's something about it. They they sort of egg each other on. Again, there have been very, very famous cases of that. Uh, one of the most famous in the 20th century was the case of Leopold and Loeb, these 1920s, what they call thrill killers. Uh, again, individually, you know, they were committing these petty crimes. They, you know, robbed, uh, uh, broke into a frat house and I think stole a typewriter. 
you know, but something about the, their connection uh, again turns very, very, very dangerous. And there have been many other cases of that. You know, the Hillside Stranglers, for example. Again, two petty criminals. You know, when they their their psychopathology starts feeding off of each other. Uh, and, you know, then it turns very, 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 very deadly. So I, I think that seems to be, you know, the case with Carl and Sherman. It was a really, like, a very commanding hierarchy in the family of, like, you know, father knows best. It's like this kind of stereotypical, um, strict, controlling family. Anya draws a distinction between organized and disorganized killers. In her view, Carl and Sherman fall into the disorganized category. I think the type of serial killer that most people are introduced to through fiction, whether it's a TV show or a mystery book, is the organized serial killer. And they're the ritualistic ones. They're the ones who are, you know, methodical. They're they're planning it. They're hunters. Um, and, you know, there's also the disorganized serial killer where they're just kind of, <laughs> uh, kind of more of a mess. And I think they might seem less intimidating to people who consume a lot of true crime because they kind of, they're not very organized or smart about how they plan their attacks. So, you know, it seems like they'd get caught quicker. I think in this case, they didn't get caught that quickly and they really racked up a, a pretty high body count, unfortunately, as a result. Uh, to put it in very plain language, I'm probably really oversimplifying it, but an organized killer is more intelligent, more socially aware, more of a planner, less likely to act on impulse. This might be someone like a John Wayne Gacy, at least in the early stage of the game, where he's able to commit a number of murders, but to do it in a way that doesn't leave behind a lot of evidence. Uh, a disorganized killer, on the other hand, uh, again to simplify, is somewhat not very intelligent, more likely to be driven by impulse, and because they act quickly and off the cuff, they are more likely to leave behind evidence which will ultimately incriminate them. And uh, at least at first blush, it sounds like the McCrary's are more on the disorganized side of the spectrum. Every New Year's, I have the same goal. It's always the same. It's always... This year, I'm going to learn a new language. And every single year around maybe January 3rd or January 4th, I just don't do it. But this year, I'm going to do it because I just downloaded Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions. Spanish this year, 2022. Here we go. It's 15 minute lessons make it perfect way to fit into anything on the go, right? So it's like 15 minutes. If I'm driving in the car and then back in an Uber, I can pop it open. If I'm on an airplane, sometimes I do two or three sessions on an airplane because you can just go through them and they're great. Plus Babbel's speech recognition technology helps you to improve your pronunciation and accent. Well, in addition to lessons, you can access podcasts, games, videos, stories, and even live classes. Plus, it comes with a 20-day money-back guarantee. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel.com and use promo code FWK. That's B-A-B-B-E-L.com. Code FWK. Babbel. Language for life. After a string of robberies, burglaries, and a hail of bad checks... Carl and Sherman begin to stir up some local heat in Texas. It was time to load up and get out of town on the US 380 westbound with their complicit wives in tow. There was something in the psyche of Carl and Sherman where individually they couldn't do it. But the mesh of those two personalities together brought out this 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 murderous streak and somewhere along the line in Salt Lake City when they went into that Winchell's donut shop in Salt Lake City they crossed the line of simply cleaning out the cash register to taking the girl with them August 12th, 1971, Salt Lake City, Utah. How do crimes like robbery, assault, even arson escalate into kidnapping or even cold-blooded murder? 
Is it kind of like how hunters start with small game like pheasants and squirrels before setting their sights on moose and bears? Or is it like a video game where your whole purpose is to level up to bolder and more audacious challenges? That's the question that arises on August 12, 1971, on a sweltering desert evening in Salt Lake City, Utah, when Carl Taylor and Sherman McCrary enter the Winchell's Donut Shop and lay their eyes on 17-year-old Sherry Martin. What happened on that night wouldn't be fully understood until three years later, in May of 1974, when Carl, in a Colorado state prison, suddenly asked to speak to Detective Joe Fanchuli of the Lakewood Department of Public Safety, Police Chief Pierce Brooks, and local journalist Bob Palmer. Carl proceeded to give a five-hour confession of his and Sherman's murder spree, laying bare the duo's terrible crimes and taking us deep into the mind of these two psychopaths. We're going to share the first part of Carl's tell-all confession right now as he explains the events of August 12th. Warning, the testimony is graphic, so listener discretion is advised. The very old recordings were severely degraded, so we used an actor to bring them to life. Uh, due to the fact that I did most of the driving, Sherman never drove. I don't know whether he was afraid to get out and try to drive or, uh, anyway, we wanted to crack a bottle. But on the way back, I decided my kids are crazy about donuts. The younger ones. So we passed this donut shop after the liquor store and I told Sherman on the way back, let me stop and get the kids some donuts. It was just me and Sherman, so we stopped, went in, and uh, I, I told this girl behind the counter that I wanted some donuts to go. So we're sitting there drinking some coffee. She's kind of an ugly looking girl, kind of heavy set, maybe 17. Anyway, we're sitting there. Sherman says, Let's rob this place. And I says, What? I thought he was kind of the nut. I thought he was kidding because I didn't know he had a gun. As it turned out there, she was there by herself with the windows drawn. Well, he told me he was going to rob it when she was in the back of the store. So he goes back and puts his arm on her and he told me to lock the door and pull the blinds down, clean the register out. Well, I had my back turned to him and as soon as I got the money out of the register, I turned around and there was nobody in the damn store but me. He was gone. So I split out the back door there and he was sitting out there with the girl in the car with him. Well, I don't know what he's got on his mind. So I was in the store by myself. So I got the two front doors locked and the blinds are down. I got the clothes signed out. So I, you know, went out the back door there. He was sitting in the car with her. And so I got in the car and I said, well, what are we going to do? You know? And he said, well, we'll take her off out there and drop her out there in the country. That way she can walk back. Well, I didn't like the way he said it because he'd been drinking wine that night and he wasn't in uh, exactly you call a sober mood. He'd been drinking about a quart of that wine and working on a second bottle. And he had a gun. Note here the beginning of a trend, one that will carry us through this whole brutal saga. It's Carl continually deflecting responsibility. It was all Sherman's idea to rob the place and kidnap Sherry Martin, he said. Later on, when they were in custody, Sherman would say the exact opposite, that this was Carl's spree, Carl's violent urge, and Sherman was just riding along. Evidence will show the truth is somewhere in between. I know that we were on the other side of Wendover, but I'm not sure of the mileage out there in the desert someplace. We went way back off on this little road off the highway we were arguing out behind the car. I told him, I said, Sherman, what are we gonna do with that girl? He said, well, she's gotta die. And I said, well, that's just ridiculous. Why she got to die? He said, well, uh, he says, you know, kidnapping carries the death penalty too. And like I said, this is before they did away with that. 
No way, I said. Number one, we haven't hurt the girl, I says. She hasn't been hurt, and there's no way they can give us the death penalty for it, even if they bust us. So I thought that I had talked him out of it. The girl wasn't uh, that frightened. She was frightened, but she wasn't hysterical or anything like that, because I'm trying to keep her calm. And we pulled over and got out, and I thought Sherman was on the other side of the car. And I turned around, started for the car when the gun started to go off. And I just froze because that first shot went off. I knew it was too late. Yeah, he just stepped around the car, started shooting, shooting, and shooting. He sat down in the seat of the car, reloaded the gun, went out, shot her, sat down in the car, and reloaded the gun, shot her some more shot the girl 17 times. It blew my mind. Like I say, I had no intentions of hurting the girl. We went on back into Salt Lake City and I was quite upset that night. And the next day, Ginger asked me what was wrong. Of course, at that time, they didn't know exactly what had, had happened. Maybe Liz did. Now, I don't I can't say what she knew and what she didn't know. Whether Liz told Ginger or maybe Sherman had told Liz, maybe Liz told her. They knew that there had been a girl in the car. They knew that we had robbed a store. They knew a girl had been in the car. We went by the house. Sherman said that I want to take the mo this money by the house. It wasn't much money. It wasn't enough. It's never enough. Next week, the McCrary's are on the move to Colorado, where another girl in another donut shop goes missing. So he's going to rape her. If I try to stop it, he'd kill me, then rape her anyway. And the only reason she was found was because the old guy that rode the ranch up there was just checking fence posts for checking fence lines. And he came across the body. The killer's M.O. emerges. Bodies were found in the in that barn. Um, it just, you know, it just had Carl and Sherman written all over it. And then once they did Sherry Martin in Salt Lake, then it became a hunger, an obsession, a way of life. I, I don't, I don't know what other words to put to it, but. It's, it's like in for a dime, in for a dollar. Once you've done it once, you know, you're, you're on your way. And a young detective is on their scent. Joe was one of the best I've seen. I mean, he really, really threw himself into this. They were like a dog on a bone on this case. It's all on episode two of Families Who Kill, The Donut Shop Murders. Families Who Kill the Donut Shop Murders is a production of Trooper Entertainment and Wondery. It is executive produced by Dave Kaplan, Randy Tatt, and Alan Weeder. Written by Alan Weeder. Co-executive produced, narrated, and edited by James Carroll. Supervising producer is Michael Wiley. Consulting producer is Detective Joe Finchuli. Ethan Darbone is the voice of Carl Taylor. Special thanks to Mark Turner and A3 Artists Agency. Mixed and mastered by Wildwoods Picture and Sound. Theme song and scoring is by Nick O'Leary and Hush Empire. Additional music is from the Jingle Punks Library. Additional production by Lily Williner. Cover art by Teenage Stepdad. If you have questions or information about the McCrary case, feel free to email us at donutshopmurders at gmail.com. It helps a lot when you subscribe, rate, and review the podcast you enjoy. Thank you for your support. 